I'm here today to give you an example of um, the failed science that is used to convince uninformed people that burning fossil fuels has had and will continue to have harmful effects on the planet. Since the start of this century, polar bears have been an icon for all that's worrisome about human-caused global warming and declining sea ice. In the year 2000, Time magazine proclaimed that the coming Arctic meltdown due to global warming put polar bears and all of us in danger. By 2006, Time told its readers that global warming was damaging the planet at an alarming rate and that we should all be very worried. In fact, Michael Mann even said, the polar bear is us. Now, virtually any story about global warming, whether it's about polar bears or not, features a winsome picture of an ice bear. There have been concerns about polar bear survival for so long now, it's probably impossible for most people to remember when it started and why. So I'll start at the point at which polar bears went from being threatened with extinction due to overhunting to threatened by global warming. The Polar Bear Specialist Group, or the PBSG, was created in 1968 as a unit of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, who had just developed a red list of threatened and endangered species. The PBSG negotiated the 1973 International Treaty to protect polar bears from unregulated hunting, a very real threat the bears had been subjected to for decades. The bears were first listed in 1982 as vulnerable, a category equivalent to the U.S. Um, category of threatened. They remained in that category until 1976, when it became clear that polar bear numbers had recovered substantially. Due to the population rebound, polar bear status changed to lower risk in 1996, now known as least concern, and it remained there for 10 years. Few people know about this fact. Polar bears had been saved, but few people heard about it. PBSG members were clearly not happy that polar bears no longer qualified as vulnerable, so in 2005, they recommended that polar bears be uplisted on the basis of population declines expected to follow from modeled sea ice loss due to global warming. And although this assessment merely reflected the opinion of PBSG members of what might happen in the future, it was accepted by the IUCN in 2006 as if it was supported by a detailed scientific analysis. Without a shred of irony, in 2006, the IUCN reported two familiar animals among 530 added to the list of endangered species that year. The polar bear, based on the opinion of scientists informed by climate models, that their numbers would decline by more than 30% over the next 45 years. And the common hippo, based on an actual decline of more than 95% in the Congo. Both were to be listed as vulnerable, one based on facts of a catastrophic local decline and the other based on prophecy. Using future threats based on climate models to declare a species threatened with extinction had never been done before by the IUCN or anyone else. It was an important first. One reason behind the ICUN IUCN decision to uplist polar bears to the vulnerable category was undoubtedly the knowledge that in the early 2005, three activist environmental groups, Center for Biological Diversity, Greenpeace, and Natural Resources Defense Council, filed a petition to list polar bears as threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, the ESA. Later that year, the group sued the U.S. government for failing to address their concerns within the time frame uh, required under ESA rules. And by 2007, American biologists at the U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS, used the modeled future threats strategy to support the prediction that polar bears would be threatened with extinction within three polar bear generations due to predicted sea ice loss 
caused by global warming. Backed by a series of internal government reports, not peer-reviewed science, the USGS used models based on one biologist's opinion of how polar bears would respond to projected summer sea ice. They focused on summer because spring, fall, and winter ice models showed no significant change by mid-century, but summer sea ice projections showed a dramatic decline. This decision forced summer to become the critical season for predicting the future of polar bears, and this is an important criteria. In 2008, the U.S. Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service accepted the USGS assessments and declared polar bears threatened under the ESA. Now, ESA regulations came on top of the blanket safeguards offered by the legally robust Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 that had allowed polar bears to prosper up to that point. And I'll point out here that in 2008, the U.S. Department of the Interior put the late 1960s global population size of polar bears at 12,000. And the USGS bio biologists used a figure of 24,500 for the population size at 2005, which meant the population had doubled prior to the ESA decision. There was much jubilation over the ESA ruling, but the caveat emphasized by the Department of the Interior um, at the announcement that the ESA could not be used to limit greenhouse gas emissions rather spoiled the celebration for many activists, since that was clearly the intention of their listing. So here's a graph showing the summer sea ice predictions that were used by USGS biologists. They used these predictions to forecast future polar bear habitat and polar bear, habit, uh, polar bear responses to those changes. They concluded that if summer sea ice declined as rapidly as predicted by mid-century, a decline in polar bear numbers was inevitable. The U.S. Geological Survey, said the science journal Nature, concluded that the animals are likely to lose 42% of their summer sea ice habitat by mid-century, cutting the world's polar bear population estimated at 25,000 by two-thirds. What they meant was that by the year 2050, summer sea ice was expected to drop below 5 million kilometers squared in 8 out of 10 years. Look at the map on the left here in this slide. According to the predictions, all of the bears in the purple and green areas were expected to disappear completely as a consequence of that magnitude of rapid sea ice decline. Ten entire subpopulations were expected to be wiped out. In absolute numbers, the global population of polar bears was predicted to fall to about 8,100 due to this degree of sea ice lost. That is, fewer bears were expected to survive at 2050 than the estimated number that existed in the late 1960 when bears were first under concern. Unfortunately for the modelers, <clears throat> Summer sea ice unexpectedly dropped in 2007 to a level not predicted until mid-century. This slide shows the September ice minimum extent at, in 2007, the panel on the left. The panel on the right is a USGF GS graph, and it shows that the 2007 extent, marked here with a vertical red line, was lower than any of the five best sea ice model predictions for 2050. In other words, it was really worse than they expected. And they must have known that they're, uh, they're uh, in trouble with their predictions, but they had no idea how bad it would really get. In fact, with the exception of two years, when the September minimum was slightly above 5 million kilometers squared, Sea ice has remained at this 2050 levels every year since 2007. In other words, the dreaded mid-century sea ice levels had arrived well before they were expected, and polar bears had no choice but to live through them. <laughs> so what happened? The predicted catastrophe failed to materialize. 
You can see from this September sea ice graph, and in this one, this, these are monthly averages, not the minimum, dropped suddenly and dramatically to, in 2007 and stayed low. The blue arrow is 2005. But the global polar bear population did not decline in response to years of low summer ice. In fact, it grew from about 24,500 in 2005 to about 28,500 28, in 2015, a 16% increase. And contrary to predictions, not a single subpopulation was wiped out. What about those high-risk populations that were supposed to be gone? Here's what the recent data says. All three of the subpopulations in Hudson Bay have been surveyed recently and found to be stable. Records also show the shift to a longer ice-free summer happened in 1998 and have been stable since. The Davis Strait subpopulation off Labrador was determined to be increasing in 2007, a trend consider considered likely to continue because of the abundance of seals. In Baffin Bay, a recent study showed that bear numbers in 2013 had increased 36% over the previous survey. And then the so-called divergent ecoregions marked in purple on this map, um, Chukchi Sea polar bears between 2008 and 2011 were found to be in better health than they had been in the 1980s, despite less ice in recent years. They spent a month longer on shore with no apparent effects on survival or reproduction. In the Kara Sea off eastern Russia, about 3,200 bears were counted in 200, 2013, the first survey ever conducted, a much higher number than the 2005 ballpark estimate of about 2,000 bears used by USGS. The Barents Sea population increased by 42% between 2004 and 2015, and finally, the southern Beaufort population declined substantially between 2001 and 2010, the only population that did decline, but it wasn't because of reduced summer ice. The decline was caused by a well-documented episode of thick spring ice between 2004 and 2006 that limited the bears' access to seal pups. Since spring is the critical feeding pe period for bears, such a limited supply of prey was devastating, especially for young bears. Many of the bears were doing well. In fact, triplets have always been rare outside western Hudson Bay. Yet the photo on the left here shows fat nine-month-old triplets in Alaska the summer of 2016. Photo on the right shows a litter of one-and-a-half-year-old triplet cubs with their mother in the Chukchi Sea in the spring of 2010. Raising triplets to nine months is quite a feat for any po polar bear mother, but getting all three cubs through the next winter requires the best conditions the Arctic can provide. And despite the rhetoric from polar bear specialists in the media, those conditions now exist off the shores of Alaska. So why were the models so wrong? Well, polar bears eat very little in the summer, um, regardless of the sea ice, because seals are hard to catch. Ring seals, the primary pay, play, prey of polar bears, do better with an open water season in the summer because that's when they feed. Ice conditions in early spring have been good for both seals and polar bears, regardless of what's happening in the summer. A well-fed bear easily survives five months in the summer wherever they live and whether they spend it on the lander of the sea ice. And finally, predictive models did not include a provision for the population side effects of periodic thick spring ice conditions such as occur in the southern Beaufort. It's now clear there's no valid evidence to support the decision that models of future risk to polar bears based on predicted impacts of summer sea ice should override assessment based on current conditions. However, there's a red flag issue we need to know about. And that is that no other nation or conservation organization in the world except the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service thinks that ring seals and bearded seals, the primary prey species of polar bears, are threatened with extinction due to predicted global warming. And that includes the IUCN Red List expert. U.S. federal biologists are outliers amongst their international peers on these species, which suggests the ESA is being improperly implemented. 
So I can run through these points to remember. Summer sea ice um, decline did not result in a polar bear number decline. Summer sea ice isn't critical for polar bear survival. The Beaufort Sea population declines, which we know about, weren't caused by summer sea ice loss. And all of the polar bear specialists, including USGS and US Fish and Wildlife biologists, know this is true, but they continue to imply that the cause was summer sea ice. Polar bear populations are now the highest they've been in 50 years and have grown 16% since 2005. And that the legally powerful US Marine Protection Act has given adequate protection to polar bears and the ESA is an inappropriate tool for dealing with protection. In short, having polar bears and Arctic seals li listed as threatened under the US Endangered Species Act is pointless and not supported by science. This obvious failure is becoming widely, widely known and certainly adds to the general public's lack of trust in science. And the science behind this presentation and explained in my recent paper that's available online as an open access document and I have these two new books that are affordable and that address these issues one for adults and high school students, and the other suitable for children seven and up. Thank you very much. <laughs>